What's going on everybody and welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. This is my co-host Jonas Walton. It's with mixed emotions that we present this episode of Chop and Brew because on one hand, we're finally getting to tell our story of the oldest, longest, continually operating homebrew shop in America, which is F.H. Steinbart Company in Portland, Oregon. On the other hand, we join the Portland homebrew community and the staff at Steinbart in mourning the loss of store owner John D. Benedetti, who passed away on April 29th, 2021. Brian Adams and I went to F.H. Steinbart during a trip to Oregon back in 2018. That year, the shop was celebrating its 100th anniversary. The staff, including our homeboy Mark Gillette, welcomed us with open arms and even invited us to collaborate on a celebratory beer kit recipe. On that day at the shop, we were lucky enough to spend part of the morning talking with John whose own father started at the shop back in 1924. I offer this episode in tribute to John, his family, the Steinbart team, and the many trailblazing homebrewers of Portland, Oregon. I hope this helps to preserve John's legacy in the canon of homebrew and craft brew pioneers. Grab a pint of something nice and join me in raising a glass as we celebrate John and 100 years of homebrewing at F.H. Steinbart Company. In April 2018, badass Brian Adams and I took a road trip from Minnesota to Portland, Oregon to visit our friends at F8 Steinbart Company. During that day at Steinbart, we toured the shop, sampled some brews, met a bunch of fans, and concocted a fine collaboration beer. But possibly the most enjoyable part of the day was the time that we got to spend talking with John. He showed us all around the shop, proudly showing off his favorite pieces of shop history, brewing collectibles, and vintage homebrewing equipment. Generations of presses, bottle cappers, hydrometers, like a museum of home fermentation. John also talked with us at length about the origin story of F.H. Steinbart, about the many eras of homebrewing the store had witnessed over a hundred years, including long before homebrewing was legal, and what he loved most about being part of the homebrewing industry and community for more than 50 years. Mr. Steinbart, uh, Frank uh, Steinbart, was originally an immigrant from Germany uh, but uh, he came to the U.S. and um, got involved in a couple of other, a couple of things, uh, not related to brewing, but then eventually started selling uh, brewery supplies. He was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, decided to move to Portland and set up a, a store here. Uh, he was a manufacturer's rep at, uh, at the start for a while, and then in 1918 he opened up a little a store on Grand Avenue in Portland here and um, working on through the uh, 20s um, and then in 19 about 1924 I think it was my father came to work with him they were selling uh, homebrew supplies then but the main the main um, uh, part of the business was supplying equipment for bars and uh, taverns, restaurants, etc. As it is now, still that's a good, uh, good part of our business. And of course, uh, prohibition uh, was enacted in, uh, I think it was nationwide in 1921 or something like that. Yeah, and then you had a whole different era with prohibition, you know, uh, wherein uh, commercial beers of a certain percentage were not uh, able to be uh, produced and sold in this country. <clears throat> and it, that created a whole new uh, atmosphere for the brewing industry, as we all know. There was um, the culture that, uh, well, um, I still want to brew, so they did satisfy that need by supplying uh, malt extract and um, some hops for those that wanted them. Uh, as I said before, a lot of the extracts were hop flavored. I would probably a great proportion of that 
of extracts that sold then were hot flavored. So uh, it was a simplicity type of thing. Uh, just the simplest you can get was the was quite popular. Talk about kind of those years before there was really a before it was legal, but b before there was just much knowledge like what was that network like in the 60s and 70s for people that were brewing mm -hmm. how were they getting their feedback how are they getting what education they could well i think that mostly word of mouth at that time perhaps so there's very little publicity about making um at least in the 60s uh, perhaps maybe even back in the prohibition era there might have been more uh more public publicity uh do-it-yourself type of thing. But in the 50s and 60s, it seemed to me it was mostly word of mouth. We were known, uh, of course, in the, in the city here, but uh, perhaps uh, there was some, some, uh, some exchange of information that way, but I don't think there was a club or anything like that going at the time, at least that I knew about. Regulars, a lot of regulars that would come in let's say once a week or every couple of weeks and get some supplies. They had to keep their batch, is a good word that they used to use, going. <laughs> Gotta make a batch. The biggest, probably the biggest thing of that, of that era was the improvement in materials uh, available. Malts improved. Um, in fact, it was tough even getting malt uh, in the 50s uh, for, the, for the small scale because the maltsters were, of course, geared towards the the big brewers. <clears throat> they didn't have packaged malt, for instance. Uh, you couldn't get it in bags. You had to get it in big uh, bins, of humongous rail cars and so forth. So that was our problem then. Although, you know, we just overcame these obstacles as they came along. But improvement in hops and yeast is a parallel that goes along with that. Yeah. So they were the uh, with the, I believe the prime manufacturer of malt extract in the in the early days, uh, Pabst went ahead and made malt extract. As they were making malt uh, for beer, they made some extract, and uh, we used to get a lot of extracts. That's where we primarily got our malt extracts was from the ribbon. But they put out this little uh, booklet, which we still have shows uh, the blue and malt extract in cans. That's the way you could get it. We had it in bulk too. But this little booklet is, I think from the 50s. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 1951. <laughs> and it showed how you can make all kinds of things with malt extract. Uh, they don't talk about beer here because uh, that was still illegal. Treat us in lager beers by Fred Eckhart. Uh, who we've been talking about quite a bit tonight, today. He was very instrumental. This is a later edition of it. Now, Fred Eckhart also um, did these little publications. These probably even preceded his book on tips about home brewing, uh, the Amateur Brewer series. This is one of the first ones. And he'd later upgraded them to look like these. But we, had, we have some publications of uh, beers, I uh, mean, you know, of, of brewers that had produced uh, some publications then that I remember uh, we used to import those books because there wasn't anything at that time. Bought over some uh, English books that <coughs> were being produced by writers over there. And that changed uh, when, uh, it started to change when Fred Eckhart, a local beer writer, uh, got um, into uh, publicizing uh, beer recipes and the beer uh, culture and really did a lot towards um, improving our beer status. He was very instrumental. And the fact that he was here in Portland was kind of nice. It's a local. Cultivating the idea that, well, you can make uh, better beers. But, you know, the idea then was, well, it was tough even to think that you could make better beer. Sometimes people didn't realize that there was better beer that you could make at home. 
yeah. people still don't know that, right? So some do, probably, yeah. yeah. Pretty, really easy, satisfied, you might say. But some old things that Jeremy just dug out from, uh, goes back to the early era. There's uh, several little things that we have here um, from an early era of Steinbart Company. This is our original dress on Grand Avenue. This, of course, is an airlock for, uh, you know, when you're making beer, you have a device, you want to have a device that lets the gases, the fermenting gases escape. It goes on through these bulbs and you put water in here, but air can't get back through it. These are hydrometers, old hydrometers that uh, we have from the beer industry. This is kind of interesting one. Acme Beer was a um, brewery in the, well this shows Los Angeles. That's a, that's a, a bottle, a, a corker. Um, <clears throat> You see, we've got some beer bottles sitting on there, but uh, the person would sit, could sit on that uh, that end of it. And if he brings that lever that's on the other side down, it's kind of weighted, and it could drive a cork into a bottle. Uh, that is Bob Farrell. He was a local home brewer, and uh, he. This is a beer, a, a mead that he made. So he gave us a bottle. Bob Farrell. When did that really nerdy part, like where where did how we ended up now start? When oh. people were really specific, technically, stylistically, how did we get to this like uh, uber expert point of home yeah. brewing? I think that that really didn't, uh, that, did, that started in the uh, 70s, well, probably the 80s. Yes, of the 80s when, um, uh, American Home Brewers Association was started uh, by Charlie Vipazian, and then a few other uh, notables in the in the industry uh, started promotion promoting um, you know uh, craft classic beers, uh, something to do on your own, but also better beers is the is the way that it evolved. Didn't didn't uh, take off overnight, but uh, that whole culture started uh, changing where and might want to make something uh, better and different from getting back a away more away from the economics um, a lot of the beer makers in the oil old days were economically um, you know induced interested just to make beer cheaper from your point of view where are we today in home brewing what kind of things are you seeing hear from the shop and hearing people wanting to do and kind of what are you enjoying about 2018? Well, I would say that uh, the way that the industry has evolved is probably the most interesting thing and in, in that uh, brewers today um, are interested in making the best beers that they, they can and they had, do have the, the uh, materials, the uh, ingredients and so forth and the equipment has changed a lot too for home brewers. Uh, you know, there's just lots of things available that were not available in the early day, oh, those early days. People had, used their, had to use their own home equipment. Uh, and that was it. It wasn't even thought of that we could have things like we have nowadays. This is what I was talking about. It's just kind of a little specialized thing. You put this over the top of your beer on a like on in the a, mash? Probably in a crock. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're fermenting. Okay. Perhaps mostly yeah, used as a fermented uh, a fermented beer when it's done. So <clears throat> attach a hose here and start siphoning, and this would float. It would go down as, you, as you're racking off. Hmm. So this little cloth, then it comes off, you see, would be a, a way to filter out yeasts and stuff. Do you still brew? Yes, occasionally. Uh, I let the uh, 
the young gurus here, the young fellows uh, do that nowadays. Uh, they do a much better job than I've ever done, I think. <laughs> what kind of years were you most uh, frequently brewing for your Well, uh, when I was working part-time uh, for my parents uh, a, little, a bit, you know, a bit then, um, I had this other job. So uh, occasionally brewing then, and then after uh, we came here, uh, we did some did some uh, brewing at home, but uh, most of it probably here. What are your favorite styles, personally, and oh, to brew? I like uh, probably full-bodied beers, such as uh, Alts was one of my favorite to make, I guess you'd call it that now. Probably didn't even know what it was then, <laughs> in the early days. But uh, nice, rich beers, tasty. How important? Is it, is it for a brewing community to have a place like Steinbart? Well, we think space? that it's, we, we think it's quite important, but I think that we probably feel that we contribute a bit to the brewing culture, you know, here. Uh, I hope that we have. Uh, we try to stay uh, up on what's happening and uh, bring in new malts and hops and different yeasts. The, you know, the, the, um, Yeasts that are available nowadays are are just quite quite different than what you used to be able to get. In fact, uh, when I first started uh, and working part time, even just on Saturdays uh, back in the fifties and sixties, we only had Fleischmann's bread yeast. Really, it was bread yeast, but that's what people used. And it made beer. <laughs> it made good bread, too. <laughs> what's it mean for Steinbart to be a hundred? What's it, what's it say that a business selling homebrew supplies can last a century? Well, it just means, uh, to me, it just means we've survived. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, we've been able to uh, stay with uh, uh, the newest trends and so forth. Thanks to Jeremy, our uh, store manager, who I can see in the background there, and Mark, uh, Mark Gillette here, and others. We've had uh, uh, very uh, active and interested people uh, be with us over the years. And a lot of our, our uh, employees have uh, gone on and, uh, well, let's say a lot. Several of our employees have gone on to open their own breweries. And you guys are going to brew something, huh? Yeah, we're going to brew. Um, Great. Are you going to stick around for that? Yep. <laughs> well, at least part of the time. Yeah. And it was a fine brew day. In tribute to Steinbart's 100th anniversary and one century in the homebrew game, we brewed an all-grain batch of a centennial ale recipe in the Grainfather. Our collaboration recipe was inspired by the Pacific Northwest's place in the pantheon of craft beer since the early 20th century. We chose a grist of mainly ESB and Victory Malt, with the stars of the show being some old-school hops that remind you they were the first cool kids on the craft beer block, Cluster and Centennial. Together, those hops bring a huge, expressive citrus, orange peel, and orange marmalade hop nose and flavor to this pale ale. Back at home, Brian and I brewed our own versions that summer, all grain, extract, and brew in a bag, but none of them lasted long enough to do a legit tasting notes on it. It was that good. The Centennial Ale Collaboration Kit is available at F.H. Steinbart's website as both extract and all grain. We would love it if you brewed the beer in tribute to John and in honor of the Steinbart crew as they enter their second century of business. We'll include the kit links in our video description and on the episode page. Before we go, I want to give a huge shout out and show of appreciation to F.H. Steinbart Company for making it possible for us to come out to Portland, Oregon and spend the day with them without their road trip 
assistance, it would not have been possible. So we are forever grateful. We also want to give shout outs and thanks to our ongoing show supporters, BSG Handcraft, Imperial Yeast, and the Patreon party people. Whoop whoop, give it up for the Patreon party people. It means everything in the world for me to have finally been able to share this episode with the world and it would not have been possible without all of your help. And there's one more treat from Portland. While we were in Portland, Brian and I shot the Imperial Yeast episode that you've likely already seen. But we also visited with Rodney Kibsey. Among Rodney's many claims to fame is the fact that he has won at least one homebrew competition medal in all 50 states in the U.S. Plus, he's a good buddy, a Midwest transplant, if you will. So it was a really fun evening of hanging out, trying a bunch of his beers, and talking about homebrewing. That episode wraps up our epic trilogy from Portland sometime in the nearish future on Chop and Brew. Until then, chop for chop, brew for brew, Cheers to you all. What? It's an NA beer from BrewDog. Hello everybody and welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. This here is my... God, these turtles. <laughs> you know what they say about working with turtles and babies. Check this turtle out. You can't really see it, but it's down here. I'm finally getting a chance to tell our story. Son of a nugget. Oldest homebrew shop in the United States, which is F.H. Steinbar Company. Straighten up, bud. <laughs> Suck your gut in. Who passed away on April 29th of this year. I almost made it. Yeah. Yeah, you can't act. You can't act mad. You can't act mad when daddy's got that pop going. Hello everybody and welcome to Chop and... Hello everyone and welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. This is my co... It's with mixed emotions that I present this episode. Uh, on one hand, we're finally getting a chance to tell our story of the old... <laughs> I can't do this! With this baby! <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Can you say, Portland rocks! Uh. The spirit of the 1890s uh. is alive in Portland, Oregon. Hello everybody and welcome to Chop... Uh. Yeah, are we... <laughs> Damn it. Brian Adams and I... <sighs> uh. Oh. Brian Adams and I went to F.H. Steinbart during a trip to Oregon back in 2018. Before we go, I want to give a huge shout out, show of appreciation, and thank you to F.H. Steinbart. <laughs> That's my ear, dog. I knew this wasn't going to be easy, but I didn't know it was going to be this difficult. Shout out and thanks to F.H. Steinbart Company for bringing us He's like, this guy's bald, y'all. <laughs> that episode... <laughs> that episode wraps up our epic trilogy from... That episode wraps up our epic trilogy from Portland sometime in the nearish future on Chop and Brew. Oh, we did it! Until then... Until then... Until then, chop for chop and brew for brew. <laughs> the intro is going to be harder to edit than the whole episode was. <laughs>